Hi, welcome to Lecture 7 for Psych 2317, Statistical Methods in Psychology. So in our past lectures, we have learned how to estimate unknown parameters like population means and to test hypotheses about those means with a single sample. In this lecture, we're going to learn what to do when we want to test hypotheses about two samples, and particularly two independent samples. That is, they have no overlap with each other. So as usual, I want to illustrate this with an example. So suppose we want to test the efficacy of a new memory treatment. So we have eight participants who are randomly assigned to one of two groups. There's a treatment group and a control group, and then are subsequently given a memory test. And so here's some summary data. We have our eight participants randomly assigned to these two groups. The treatment group that we can see here has a mean of 50 and SS for the sum of squares for group one is 250. And then we have a control group with scores here. Their mean is 45 with an SS of 184. And so our question is, does the treatment group score significantly higher than the control group? Now, of course, this is a research question that we will convert to a statistical question and try to answer using our statistical methods. But how do we do that? Well, to work this out, the first thing we're going to do is introduce a new descriptive measure. We're going to measure the effect of the treatment. What exactly do we mean by that? Well, we're going to talk about the concept of effect size. So a common measure of effect size is something called Cohen's D. And D is roughly defined as the difference between the means divided by the standard deviation. Okay, so as in a sense, the effect size measures how big the treatment is, uh, how big the treatment effect is in terms of the standard deviation. Now, Part of this is really easy to do. What is the difference between means? It's just simply what it says. It's the difference between those two means. So we can compute that easily by just subtracting those two group means that we got. But what about this standard deviation? This presents a bit of a problem because there are actually two standard deviations here. So what is the standard deviation for this effect? Well, the solution that I'm going to introduce you to today is that we are going to pool these two standard deviations into one. Okay. So let's talk about what that would mean. A pooled standard deviation is defined as the weighted average of the standard deviations from the two groups. And the weights are determined by the relative sample size. So if you know anything about performing weighted averages, you could figure out how to do this from scratch. But it turns out that there's a very nice formula that allows us to get this weighted average with some simple descriptive statistics that you already have dealt with that I'll show you in a second. So mathematically, we can compute this pooled standard deviation, which we denote as sigma hat with a P as a subscript. The P means pooled here. And we can find it by simply taking the square root of SS1 plus SS2, so the two groups, individual sums of squares, divided by DF1 plus DF2, so the sum of the degrees of freedom of the two groups. Now I claim that this should actually be a natural thing to do, and the reason is this. You may remember from our previous lecture we defined sigma hat, the estimated population standard deviation, as the square root of SS over N minus 1. Well that's really just the same thing as writing the square root of SS over DF. So how would you combine these together if you had two groups? Well this is what you might come up with. And it turns out that that works exactly. So to compute effect size, we need the difference between the two means. We've got that. We need this pooled standard deviation. Well, we now have a formula for doing that. So let's go ahead and work this out. Let's compute Cohen's D. Okay. Now in, in a formula, Cohen's D would look like this. It would be the difference between the two means divided by this pooled standard deviation. Well, let's figure out that pooled standard deviation. So as we just presented, the formula is the square root of the SS's over the DF's. If we go ahead and put those values in from back in the table, we get the square root of 250 plus 184 over 3 plus 3, 
Remember, we have four in each group, and the degrees of freedom is the group size minus one. So let's do a little bit of arithmetic here. This combines to the square root of 434 over 6, which is the square root of 72.33, which to two decimal places is about 8.50. Now we can compute, we can finish here, our Cohen's D, the difference between the means over the pool standard deviation. Well, that would be 50 minus 45 divided by this pool standard deviation, which is 5 over 8.5, which is about 0 0.59. So what this says is that the effect of the treatment is a little over half a standard deviation. Okay. So is that a big effect? Is it a small effect? We need some guidelines here. Well, Cohen himself recommended the following guidelines for interpretation. So if this measure D is less than 0.2, Cohen recommended that we call this a small effect. Anything around 0.5? would be a medium effect, and then anything bigger than 0.8 we would call a large effect. So for our effect, we got 0.59, we're going to call that a medium effect. Okay. And again, this is, these are just guidelines, so there's no hard and fast rules for exactly when you go from small to medium, but if you want to describe the numerical effect size in terms of a, a word description, these are kind of some guidelines to do so. Very common in our field. So we have a medium effect. The next question is, is it statistically significant? And to answer that, we have to develop a new kind of test, and that is the independent samples t-test. So now we're going to develop that test, and we're going to use what we've done in the past to make some extensions that work now for two independent groups. So how's this going to work? Well, we need to remember how hypothesis tests work. Hypothesis tests work as follows. First, we define two competing hypotheses, a null and an alternative. We then assume that the null is true, and we compute the probability of observing our data if the null is true. Remember, those are kind of the three cornerstones for how a hypothesis test works. Now, how this is done, at least in the context of a t-test, which we introduced in the last lecture, is we convert our data to a t-score. It's like a standardized score, right? We convert our data to this t-score, and then we find the probability of obtaining that observed t-score or more extreme. Again, assuming that the null is true. So how does this work? Well, let's go ahead and work out this hypothesis test. First thing we'll do is we'll define two population means. We have two independent groups now, so we need a, an unknown mean for each group. So we'll let mu1 be the population mean of the treatment group, and we'll let mu2 be the population mean of the control group. Now, I chose these in this manner. You could easily reverse them. It would be just fine. But this is what we're going to do for this problem. Once we've done that, we define our two hypotheses. Now, for the independent samples t-test, the null hypothesis is that there's no difference between the two groups, that they are the same. We would write that as mu1 equals mu2. And then the research question was, does the treatment group have higher scores than the control group? So we would encode that as, is mu1 bigger than mu2? So our alternative would be written in a directional manner like that. Then, as you know from the examples we've done so far, we assume the null is true, and we now want to compute the t-score for our observed data. That's going to let us compute the probability of observing our data under the null. Well, how do we compute the t-score? Well, this is going to take a little bit of work. Let's think first about the general form of a t-score, like we did last time. If we leave out the symbols and just write what they are, the t-score is really just the sample mean minus the population mean over the estimated standard deviation divided by the square root of the sample size. And go back and look at the formula that we used in lecture six, and this is exactly what it comes down to. But we've got to be a bit more general about this because we don't have one sample mean anymore. We don't have one population mean. We don't have a single standard deviation. We don't have a single sample size. How do we put all of this together? Well, the answer is found essentially in that pooling procedure that we found earlier. 
And the result looks like this. So this is a specific formula that you'll want to write down. We define our t-score as the difference in the sample means minus the difference in the population means. And then we convert this division statement here to something a little bit different, but it turns out to be quite a nice generalization. And that is we take the pooled standard deviation times the square root of one over n1 plus one over n2. I know it doesn't look quite the same as this, but they are equivalent mathematically if you think about it a little bit. But the t-score that we're going to use, this is what makes the independent samples t-test work, is this guy right here. So let's see how that works. So if the null is true, okay, so that means that mu1 equals mu2, then we have the following. So let's write out this t-score. Again, here's just the formula for the t-score written out again. Let's replace all of the things in this t-score with their actual values. So the mean of group one is 50, the mean of group two is 45, and then the difference, mu1 minus mu2, because mu1 and mu2 are equal, this difference is zero. And again, that's under the assumption that the null is true. We divide this by the pooled standard deviation, which at the beginning of the lecture we found was 8.50. And then we multiply that by square root of one over the sample size of group one, which is four, plus one over the sample size of group two, which again is four. So we'll take the top difference, which is five, and then we multiply this part down here at the bottom to get five over 6.01, which we can then simplify to 0 0.83. So the t-score associated with our data is a little less than one. Hmm. So what do we do with this? Well, we need to compute the probability of finding that t-score if the null is true. So what we really are trying to do is this p-value. It's the probability of getting a t-score greater than 0 0.08, or sorry, greater than 0.83 if the null is true. Okay. Now remember, we have a calculator for doing this, and I'm going to pop that up in just a second, but the calculator requires that we specify the degrees of freedom because the t-distribution depends on the sample size. So how do we do that? Well, the degrees of freedom we're going to just consider as the sum of the degrees of freedom for the two groups. DF is equal to DF for group one plus DF for group two, which is three plus three, which is just six. So let's go to our calculator. And remember, this is our uh, calculator that we've been using all semester. The link is in the notes below. We want to select the T distribution we need to specify the degrees of freedom to be six. And now we're wanting the probability that T is bigger than 0.83. So we want an upper tail benchmarked at 0.83. So we put a 0.83 in for A. And we can see that distribution here and we can see that probability is 0 0.219, 0 0.219. So what do we do with this? Well, remember, this is now where we make a decision about our hypotheses. This is the probability of observing our data if the null is true. Now, in past examples, we found if that number was small, that meant that the data were rare under the null, and so we would reject the null in favor of the alternative and make a conclusion based on that. But here we have something where this probability is roughly 22%. That's not rare at all. That's actually quite plausible. So here I'll say that the observed data is plausible if the null is true. So in terms of the procedure, that means that I fail to reject the null. I can't throw out the null. The data could have occurred. So if I fail to reject the null, that leaves the null as probably the simplest model of this data. And so our conclusion is that the treatment group does not score significantly higher than the control group. We actually still have some support for the null in this case. And so that's the end of that hypothesis test. So again, we computed our t-score. That was here. We found this probability based on that t-score. And then because that probability was greater than 5%, which is our typical cutoff for these kinds of things, 
We reasoned that the observed data was plausible, so we failed to reject the null, and we concluded that there was no significant difference, that the treatment group did not score significantly higher. Okay. And that's it. That's how an independent samples t-test works. So we learned today to measure the size of the effect in terms of something called Cohen's D, and then we learned how the independent samples t-test works, and primarily the main thing is that we have a new rather complicated formula for the t-score, but everything else logic-wise is the same. So that's all for lecture seven. Uh, next time we will now, we will learn how to move from just hypothesis testing to actually doing confidence intervals again. It's been a while since we did that, so we, we will have all the tools that we need. So that's all for this time. We'll see you at the next video.